single right now. Cool. Okay, we're being recorded. So, um, so, so there are several topics we can we can talk about. Um, uh, Sala just posted to OCAP.js um, uh, a pointer to what's been going on with import maps um, and things about that, um, which I have not had a chance to look at yet. And I know that import maps is something that we that we would be needing to pay attention to, but I have not yet paid attention to it. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, at Agoric on Friday, uh, we had an internal uh, planning session uh, uh, to figure out what the phases of development are uh, to move ahead with SES. Um, and um, uh, so talking that out uh, in the group, in particular, uh, the issues having to do with uh, moving the steps, the phases of moving towards safe modules in Jesse and SES is very relevant to this group. Um, so both of these are directly related to uh, module issues. And those were the two agenda items I had. There was also the email that you sent about uh, wiring modules, right? Oh, yes. Or would yes. it be for Thursday meeting? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would like to talk about that and to take a look at that. Was the module map thing the thing about Chrome and the import uh, mapping to an internal module? The, imp the import map, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that there is uh, now a first <sighs> yeah. STD module, which is <clears throat> the wrong name because it's host specific it's not it's it's not um part of the javascript standard it shouldn't yep. be occupying the std namespace yep, yep, yep. um uh, maybe it should <laughs> well uh, the um okay uh you've looked at it i haven't so i'm, I'm I curious know. i'm being sarcastic you know like they called it std so so it's obviously a place to get contaminants, you know. Like. Oh, I see. Right, <laughs> right. STD. Got it. Okay. Um, and also as part of the wiring discussion, um, uh, we've, we've also been uh, discussing the, um, the issue of how does uh, either a module, I mean, or, or sorry, rather a package or an application uh, express what it's expecting such that uh, some policy decision in making a decision about what, pro what to provide it, what specific thing to provide it, can be doing that in the context of an expectation about what kind of thing uh, uh, it's expecting and therefore what kind of thing to provide it. Um, yeah, Mark and I were talking about a general issue of um, programmer communication, you know, and, and within the ecosystem, how do you, um, you write some code, you're expecting it's going to interact with some other code or be provided with certain facilities. The way that you express what it is that you're hoping to get is traditionally with an import or a require of some sort. And people kind of converge on something like the NPM registry. And there are other mechanisms you might express that, but which are the ones that people are going to be familiar with and that they can search for and they can look up. And then that then is an input to some sort of policy decision or some sort of you know, somebody closer to the actual execution of the code is the one that gets to choose whether to honor or how to honor those different requests. Yeah. So, um, uh, so I, so of all of these things, uh, I suggest we start out with uh, import maps um, because that's um, an external thing that's happening that we need to understand and it's happening on its own timetable that we don't control. So I just, I first heard about that this morning when some of my Mozilla friends were complaining about, you know, another Google sort of redefining what the web is unilaterally complaint. Has this been visible longer than that? Have other people been aware of this before today? Yes, uh, yeah, I, 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 I've, we've actually discussed it in the occasional meeting here. Bradley's brought it up many times. Okay, good, good. Uh, so it's something we've known we've needed to pay attention to. Um, 
uh, and it's been, uh, I believe it's been visible on the W3C side of things. Okay. Uh, it has not really been visible at the, the TF, TC39 side of things, except that TC39 people have known we've me needed to pay attention to it. Okay. Yeah, um, we, we've paid attention to it. Um, I actually uh, said out loud in a Node.js meeting a while back that uh, I'm so sorry. I think the only conclusion at this point is that we should be paying attention to new things like import maps. Um, and I, you know, I was embarrassed because I didn't know uh, enough about it to actually weigh a decision we were making at that point. Right. Um, um, and you know, since then, um, it's a browser thing, right? So we, we have a, a, um, a mirror of it, something called export maps that we've been working on. Um, it was uh, a proposal uh, by some people on the modules group, um, but I, I think it was uh, spearheaded by Jan. Um, um, so so I'm, I'm gonna post some details about that in um, OCAP. JS at some point. Um, so, but but in there we've addressed all these security concerns <laughs> regarding how uh, what import maps would look like in in an OJS world. Um, and can, can I? I just want to interrupt briefly with a um, uh, a Zoom issue that's distracting me. Um, for everybody else, I'm seeing icons rather than video. I would like to also be transmitting or you know, showing an icon for myself rather than video. The only control I see is stop video. And when I turn it off, my, I, I don't see anything anymore. What is that? Uh, we, we can share a screen. I, I was preparing to do that. Um, I, just, I, was, I just want Mark's trying to turn his own camera off. Yeah. Yeah. So that works. Your camera's off. Um, well, now my screen is off too. I'm not seeing you guys. Uh, so, so I think because it's uh, maybe Zoom is thinking we're doing an audio only kind of thing. So it, they never thought about like a video conference with, um, with no <laughs> video participants. But for everybody else, I'm not seeing the video. I'm just seeing the icons. There, are, there is no video from anybody else. Somebody yeah. has turned the camera on briefly. Yeah, I can start mine very briefly. <laughs> okay, so yeah, Sala, Mark, I'm Mark. seeing video for you. Yeah, hit stop video. Happens. Okay, so I hit stop video. Oh, oh, I see. So as long as one person has video, then we can all see who's talking yes. and all that. And if nobody has video, yes. then we go to that other useless screen. I think that's right. That's really Although stupid. Maybe that little up arrow next to start video might give you more options. Okay. Yeah, so a, a video conference is very easy to abstract as um, one or many videos uh, in streams, right? So, I see. <laughs> and then never think about it because you've already made the uh, model to work from. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, I'm going to share my screen so it's not going to be all void. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking for a good screen to share, which I was like really looking at for a long while there. Oh, why don't we start with this? Okay, how do I, I'm just gonna share my entire screen. Yeah, I'm gonna share everything. I have no screen. Okay, good, <laughs> good. And I, I see that and um, uh, so, uh, and my apologies for all of that interruption. We can go back to the actual topic. Yeah, so, so I was really not, not, um, concerned about import maps until I saw it being used to prop up yet another proposal, which is STD, uh, in, in very, very wrong ways. And on a, on a blog of Google, you know, a browser developer of all uh, places, um, and I have no problem with the idea of built-in modules. In fact, I actually want to see globals be a legacy feature in a legacy sandbox that people opt in because some code um, needs to stay alive, apparently, um, but is not important enough to update. Go figure. Um, 
so so what we're doing in security instead is <laughs> we're creating safe compartments initialized in unsafe initially unsafe environments which which goes the you know the opposite uh but but the idea that we have modules means that we have a new playground where you can import your globals and not rely on global scope in a module but to do that you have to do a thinking of all the edges not not just thinking of uh, KV dash storage would have looked very bad as a global name because you can never refer to it with a period. You need to actually refer to it as a named entity. Um, so all that I'm, I'm okay with, you know, these are all details related to STD, um, which whatever, it's not in my hand, but I come to this part here. Yeah, that was interesting. If, if you guys uh, want the summary of import maps. Yes, yes, please, please start. I mean, it's something I've no, I know I've needed to pay attention to, but I have not actually paid attention to it yet. This is exactly how it's not supposed to be used. That's the summary of it. So the idea that import maps uh, was, was actually trying to solve is the fact that most um, packages in the node ecosystem refer to modules with something we refer to as bare specifiers, not relative URL um, uh, parts. Um, can you, so, can you say, that again? say that again, please? Yeah, so when I'm work, writing require like imports, you know, using require to import modules on, in Node, I often don't have a, a relative path in there. I just refer to a bare specifier, like import awesome package. No okay. slash, no HTTP, no file, no, all, all these path specific aspects are fundamentally dropped um, off uh, from the prefix and you start with a bare name. Um, optionally, if you wanna dig deep and, and, and you wanna do something called a deep import, you say awesome package and then you add a relative path thing, slash whatever. Um, but but we do it because that's how we talk about paths um irrespective of if it's on windows or whatever you use just just a kind of a as a like a path like approach to refer to files inside a particular third party package um so when 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 ECMAScript modules landed in the browser forcing people to you know use extensions, hopefully not MJS, and you know, always use relative paths or absolute paths. Uh, it, it forced people to be like, oh, wait a second, Node taught us we should not be worried about all that. Um, Node is nice, we want Node in the browser. Um, so import maps were designed really to say that if I say in this JSON-like object, key, kv dash storage, I can do a semicolon, open the bracket, and then, you know, in this array, I give it one or more um, actual URLs from which it would import that particular uh, module when I use the bare specifier, i.e. this part here, in my own module. So, so in this module, they're importing what is obviously not a bare specifier. Um, and they are saying import maps will allow you to say it's, it's either the built-in, and if that doesn't exist, then it's uh, user code that I will give it to it. Um, so in a gist, import maps are a manifest approach to define the file systems searching operations that Node.js does for you when you require a module without giving it a particular Node module's absolute path to import from. Um, and they did that by having you actually create every single record you want to refer to that is not a path. Um, and it, it just looks up in this map to give you what you need. A cleaner way of using this in this example has been to have the key be kv storage and the values be something like browser colon kv storage or host colon 
followed by the polyfill? Let's not get hung up about this part here. Okay. Uh, let's say that the first one says the built-in thing, and the second one says, here's the path to a thing that is a polyfill in case there is no built-in thing. Got it, okay. So the okay. idea would be that, that if the browser already provides something that is the key in the import map, then it doesn't need to bother with the values. Yes, that, that's absolutely correct. So then this is strictly a fallback, not a, 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 an absolute mapping. No, they're, they're, they're really um, um, mashing things up together. That was a third proposal called layered modules or layered imports. Let's not get into that. that the idea that they have an array with fallback here is a new feature um, of, of another proposal happening called layered um, resolution or layered whatever, which, which said that we would use a, a pipe and, and give a string. So I import std whatever pipe and that path. Forget about import maps. I just put that in this string over here and somehow magically. By pipe, you just mean vertical bar, right? Yes, yes, okay. like that thing that, um, you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, obviously it's not a good idea to have that in a file name, so it's understandably a good choice. Um, but, but, you know, so, so that was a different proposal. And, you know, to, to make things, uh, I guess, you know, to, to, to simplify the world and to be able to give this article time very, very well, you know, around whatever will happen at TC meetings, um, they just put all these features together in one example. So does, once it's translated, is it, if it translates to a name that another record would translate to something else? Does it keep translating until it settles, or does it only translate at one level, or how so do these? Let's, obviously, they're both experimental proposals that are obviously changing depending on what article is writing about them. So what would be the reasonable thing to assume if that has been the rule so far? There's only one import map declared. Um, and KV storage is obviously going to be a module record in an otherwise up to spec idempotent map. I, I really, really hate to see, you know, people um, having, you know, schemes, protocols, URLs, masquerading uh, something is coming from a trusted CDN when it's actually coming from a third party just because they could create a script tag in my page. Well, okay, so um, uh, the, um, so putting on my, uh, how does a normal web security person, or at least a normal Chrome web security person, think about what the threat model is and what the threat model is not, um, uh, they would say, uh, if you can put a script tag uh, on the page, then um, you have complete control anyway. Um. That, that's true. You have complete control in, um, in a, you know, from the perspective of you control what the user is going through uh, in that experience, but you are not uh, executing live code injected with other code that is um, served by a server, a, a server uh, sending modules that interconnect to one another. Um, not expecting one module to be um, a middleman module or a man in the middle module um, that will, um, on behalf of Google, a good example here, hack you and make you think it was Google, for instance. That, that, that's the, you know, the most innocent uh, scenario for, for misusing this. I'm sorry, can you, can you go through that? Maybe, maybe bring up a text editor and write out what the attack looks like? Yeah, well, I, I have not thought about that, which is good that I'm actually being forced to do that. So import um, um, trusted thing okay. from Okay, so this is the example of the victim, the code that's trying to say something trusted that's being attacked. Well, yes. Um, okay. 
So Good. there are different scenarios we can consider here. Uh, mm -hmm. if this, is, this can be in one of many scenarios. So um, uh, module one would uh, be basically, uh, so, so the scenario I'm actually concerned about is if this is on, um, let me have that stuff. Or it's uh, yeah. For some reason, it's grayed out or 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 something. Yeah, VS Code is uh, helping me understand that I'm writing code that is not important. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I I don't know how. I got to it. Fix it's, that it's, uh, it de, de highlights imports. It's it's visible enough. It's fine. Yeah. So oh, maybe I can do this. Now it's important. <laughs> So, so yeah, it became relevant, right? So, so I, I uh, send out this module that we're looking at right now coming from an HTTPS with whatever SSL um, um, and, and, and I'm basically uh, a particular um, provider of a secure Um, uh, transaction uh, service, whatever it is, I'm, I'm not going to get into the details. Okay, so this code, so the the code, the the text that we're looking at right now, is uh, um, the is not malicious. It's the code that is trying to express something with integrity, and it's the thing that we're going to try to attack with an import map. Is that correct? Yeah, um, and and. and um, we are going to attack this by actually, uh, where am I, oh yeah, because I'm, I'm doing a standing uh, meeting today. I had to not be sitting all day, so uh, that's why I'm pressing the wrong keys. So, <laughs> so, um, so I guess the problem now becomes if right before my code, uh, there was an HTML that had a script type equals import map, which is not a mime type. What, what are they thinking? And over here, um, I'm just going to write in a comment. Uh, we made the absolute URL here, this one, be something else. So the all the JavaScript is vulnerable to the host that sets it up. The host is controlled by the HTML page. Yeah. So I, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I think I'm. Th that. Yeah. That... I, don't, yeah I don't. I don't understand why this attack is a th is 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 a threat or is illegitimate. It seems like uh, if you have the ability to determine the contents of a script tag on the HTML page, you really are in control. And from a Kaha or SES uh, point of view, uh, we actually, um, you know, Kaha initializes the frame um, uh, before it loads anything untrusted. And one of the things that it does is actually um, uh, uh, part of Domata, the, the, the browser component of Kaha, uh, was a um, URL rewriter, basically. They gave you the ability to, re to, to uh, remap the dereferencing of any name. Uh, and likewise, we've been constructing uh, you know, all of our discussions about the safe module system is that if Realm, if, if uh, you know, code in, in, in Realm A sets up new root Realm B, uh, that Realm A should be in complete control over the import namespace uh, seen by B. So this, this seems like it's consistent with all of that. I, I, I fully appreciate that. Um... So I'm not really voicing my particular uh, words, but I'm, I'm echoing the sentiment that made it impossible for service workers to do the exact same thing. Uh, oh, 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 because service workers have no HTML? 
no, service workers cannot uh, shadow domains for which they are not scoped and they only get scoped oh. Oh, 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 oh. Right. origin. And, right. and because that is problematic, uh, people who have learned to, to appreciate these consistencies uh, will assume those consistencies unless they're po pointed out as inconsistencies. So, uh, so right. I remember we yeah, we've we've done a lot of looking at. Well, we've talked in these meetings about the service workers thing, and um, it's clear that service workers, as spec, because of exactly the issue you just mentioned, are not an adequate. Uh, uh, intermediation mechanism uh, to do confinement because uh, they can only intercept uh, external network requests to the origin as you that you know that they're scoped to uh, if if the frame that you want to confine is making requests to arbitrary other origins yes. then it won't get incepted, intercepted by a service worker so I, w I was not privy to the discussion they had uh, to come to this conclusion, which obviously uh, involved uh, making very conscious decisions uh, about things that were or were not discussed um, um, you know, publicly uh, as a security threat. But I, as a developer, I saw that browsers are, are g giving me a guarantee by making this move that my code from my origin is not uh, going to, is actually, it's a priority for browsers to ensure that it's not going to have injected modules uh, happen because they, when they were making service workers, they made a, a very clear gesture that showed me that. Okay, so I think, I mean, the service worker thing is, is, is if you think of the service worker as providing a, local analog of a remote origin, um, uh, what they're doing makes sense. If you think of the service worker as uh, providing an intermediation between a frame and the external world, the service worker doesn't make any sense, um, uh, which is you know, why, why we ran into a problem with it for our purposes, because that's what we need for confining the code in a frame. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the what you're showing here with import map does make sense in terms of being of of expressing control of what's happening in the frame. Only, um, only if my module served from an origin that is different, uh, I'm 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 providing my module as a service entry point for consumers to use off of my service. Um, and I, I, and while I, if I, if that was a service worker, um, I would have had control to ensure that nobody injected a, a, a rogue module that can listen to anything happening with trusted thing. Uh, import map, which is in the HTML that I have no control on, um, gives um, the author of that page the ability, or or, or even someone hacking. Um, an HTML page, the ability to use an import map to inject a module that will run thinking that it's coming from my secure service uh, that I offer as a third party to this particular page. Um, can you tell me the, the stance that, so you're looking at the service worker API and you're sort of concluding or deducing that they have a particular stance that says, you can mess up your own origin, but you can't mess up code coming from somewhere else. Yeah. Is that a way of, of characterizing your, your deduction? Yeah, or, or even folders that uh, are normally not under your uh, current path, like parent folders are, are um, by default out of scope. Okay, so, well, so it's as if that they are saying um, the code coming from those other origins is somehow less vulnerable, it, 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 the, it, the code is somehow not vulnerable to the current page. The current page can't cause um, fetches to those 
other origins to come from somewhere else. I think it's, it could be better phrased that it can only be intercepted or shadowed or overwritten by a service worker hosted and, and uh, provided by the same origin the module is coming from. So, so if I'm offering my service, I'm telling you, you have to also register my service worker in order for my service to be properly serviced uh, to your page. Um, and you, there's no problem in having multiple service workers because each one of them has its own unique scope. Uh, one is the origin of, of the page the user will look at, and the other is the origin of the page that uh, is providing the trusted service uh, for the page being looked at. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I'm, I'm kind of imagining a, uh, there's a hierarchy of authorities here. You know, in our usual pattern where the HTML page is the one that gets to, well, the user agent controls the entire experience. The user agent's choices are broken up into what add-ons are involved, what uh, URL is being fetched. That delegates to the contents of the initial page. That delegates to some combination of service workers that it loads in, additional scripts that it loads in. And it'd be nice if, if the web could provide sort of a coherent ordering of, of who gets to be in charge and who's delegating to whom. And it sounds like with the service worker API, it implies that, uh, that, that there's a claim that says the origin of the, um, the origin of the resource you're pulling in is higher priority than the index.html that's making the script tag to pull it in because the service worker that's set up in one can't go and override that. Um, but, but really that first HTML page is the primary authority. It's the one that gets to decide everything else. Um, I, I think that's, that's an easy way to try to uh, look at it at first, but think about it maybe in a, different, in a slightly different way. Okay. When it comes to a resource coming from the origin of the index.html, the service worker of the index.html is the absolute authority on whether or not it can be serviced in a particular way locally. However, when it comes to a resource coming from the origin of another origin, like another thing that is not the same origin as, as, as that of the index.html, mm -hmm. and that origin has the say and the, the priority to determine how it could locally be serviced, shadowed, morphed, or whatever. Um, because service workers are not meant to solve importing packages from different origins and, and caching them in a way that is ideal to mimic um, NPM packages. They were designed for caching because application cache was designed uh, for something else, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did not do his job very well. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm, I'm. So I understand that this is very different than service workers. Uh, th that doesn't, to my mind, make this itself wrong or incoherent. Um, uh, it, it. Um, uh, it just means that there's a priority in not confusing it with what service workers are doing. Um, uh, where does the import map only come from the HTML? Was there no API for for setting or manipulating the import map? Um, sorry, uh, could could you um, could you repeat that? I I, I didn't catch it. Yes. Um, does, is the, does the import map only get set from the HTML like you've shown, uh, or uh, is there some API for setting or manipulating an import map? So import maps, I'm just at the page where it's at right now. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. So they're talking about um, well, the format we agree. Um, I I think they were talking more about the mechanics of of what the map does. Um, but um, the idea that it's a type import map—that was the first time I ever saw that. 
Yeah, I haven't, I've never seen, I didn't know that they were doing type for purposes like that. That's a surprise to me. But I, I would be, um, uh, you know, amazed if, let's say, Safari, oh, they did actually. When that was added, I'm not sure, but I, I, I would still be amazed if Safari, for instance, uh, allowed it to actually um, take, you know, uh, take effect. Um, but, but I think we, sh we should be really concerned that an article in a blog as, 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 as important to, the, to web developers for, for build, propping up expectations, um, it, you know, blows lines of, of standards that are contentious at the very least, uh, proposals, sorry, that are, you know, or at least worthy of, of a little bit more thought, puts them all together to make a good um, um, pitch for someone who is not required to spend time to actually see whether or not their hopes are being built towards something that is actually tangible. That was my concern, really. Um, my second concern, obviously, is STD. And, you know, I hope we're all having, you know, uh, you know, you know, if, 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 if STD is sounding good to anyone, uh, or the fact that it's actually a, a scheme, not maybe um, some um, non-URL non specific um, feature, like, like import um, being used here um, at, at to, you know, at some point they were thinking that import would be the scheme. Um, so how does it work if my import map says uh, I should use import uh, in order for me to use the bare specifier? So it's going to be import followed by another scheme. Um, then that will basically mean that um, my module will only work in places where an import map can be created. There are so many things that are left not thought out for this to be um, in, in the place that it was posted today or, or this week. So the thing that was posted uh, today or this week was the the first standard module, or was there more posted about the import map idea in general? I, I, I was on, this was the only thing that was brought to my attention. Okay. Uh, um, you know, uh, because um, I, somehow I had my notifications on and I saw that they were um, concerned uh, in Node uh, in some threads. Um, because node does not use a prefix. We thought about the idea of a prefix and we uh, avoided using it because we came to very, very reasonable conclusions that once you make this a URL, you have to think of all the cases where this will not be filed and this will be something that is potentially a URL on some operating system. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds from this discussion, it sounds like things are not settled or well specified yet, even though browsers are going ahead and implementing things. Chrome. Chrome, okay. Which is everything other than Mozilla and, and Safari at this point, really. Mm. Okay. Um, Should we switch to another topic? I'm not sure that we're that we know enough to really get more out of discussing this topic. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully down the road, like like I'm actually this came at a perfect time. I was trying to build the case of how to um, safely uh, create a way to expose built-ins, um, and uh, this just came, you know, at the height of me thinking about it today. So. <laughs> Um, but down the road, hopefully, I'll have something more tangible, um, you know, at least an, a different idea on how we can go about this. Okay. So I, I have a quick question. I came in late because of Zoom. Um, is, this, is, this an, is this a proposal? Is this a thing that they're announcing the release of? Is, what, what is the status of this import map thing? Well, I think the best way is to just take their word for it. 
Well, I mean, if, if Chrome is experimenting with it, that's different than this is a web standard. Well, there's a proposal in TC39 that, that obviously has a lot of interest. I'm sorry, there's, there's a TC39 no, uh, proposal? No, I thought, I thought it was... S for STD, not, not for import maps. Sorry, sorry. We'll right, no, I was talking about import maps. I just, I had never seen it before. And the question is, is this just because, because web standards are infinitely large and therefore you haven't seen most of them, or is it because this is something that just appeared on the scene this week? No, import maps have been, have been uh, a website um, um, idea that has been originating from, you know, uh, I'll just leave the context basically. Yeah, no, of course. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so uh, but, but, but in all fairness, there are a lot of merits on what import maps can actually solve. But but they are not they are not ready to be uh, piggybacked on uh, in a post meant to get web developers to think of things uh, as if they are uh, ready to be used in the browsers. Like this venue is very wrong for this kind of um, debut of of this. <laughs> so, anyways. Uh, I hope that that addressed um, your question. Okay, I'm not sure it did, but I'm not sure we're going to do better. <laughs> well, let's be hopeful. I'm, I'm I'm wondering if the 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 thing just just by kind of skimming it as it's kind of flown by there, that this this KV storage thing. Mm -hmm. Is it that the people who are doing this, they really just don't give a crap about import maps. They just want to do their KV storage thing and somehow they've entangled them. Uh, I think you can ask, is it any different uh, in any other case? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, the thing is, is they're tooting their horn about something. And if this is just an incidental detail as opposed to the main event, um, then that's, that's different. But, but obviously that puts it out there. You know that detail will get people's attention now. If import map was not on the radar, it got on the radar without talking about it. Yeah. So this is how we prop up people to be disappointed. Yeah. Exactly by by not talking about the thing that they will expect from us. Yes, the curse of energetic, stupid people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right, yeah, so I'll hand it over. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So, um, uh, so I would like to uh, talk about the um, the wiring issue, the top level wiring issue. Um, uh, so let's see. I will. I'm going to project something. Okay, exit full screen. Okay. I'm still learning my way around Zoom and all that. Okay. Yeah, I would think that's most of them doing. Okay, does everybody see my email, my, my email browser window? Uh, with the message being declarative winding can be expressed better as code? Yes. Okay. Um, so let's see. Okay. So uh, the context here is that um, uh, Kate has uh, created um, uh, two repositories that are intended to be 
extremely simple examples, basically as sim approximately as simple as possible while still having enough structure to explore the differences between the, the approaches. Uh, she wrote a little uh, to-do application um, uh, using a, uh, a very small number of dependencies. Um, uh, and uh, uh, some of which are best thought of as originally being pure modules and some of which are thought of as originally being resource modules and some of which are best thought of as originally being uh, resource globals. Um, what do you mean by originally? Uh, meaning that uh, the dependencies are, uh, there's three, um, let's take a look at legacy to do. That's actually the best way to do this. Okay, so here's Kate's legacy to do repository. And uh, I, can, can we zoom in uh, slightly when we get to code? Uh, I'm so I, I hit zoom twice, right? Is this, do, does, is the font size on this look good? I, I think it does now. I, I wasn't, I didn't notice that you zoomed oh. in while I was uh, preparing to say that, so. <laughs> okay, okay, <Sorry> good. <laughs> good, okay, that's, that's fine. Okay, so, uh, so the, the index.js of the legacy to do repository is, you know, the main is the, is the top level of the application itself. Uh, and the legacy one is the one that is written to use existing globals and packages. So in particular, there's already an NPM package called minimist, an NPM package called chalk, and an NPM package, uh, is readline new? I don't remember that one. Uh, it's not new. Okay. Um, I, I haven't been paying attention to read line. Um, uh, in any case, I, uh, so uh, chalk and minimus are what I've been paying attention to. Um, and then chalk in turn um, uh, makes use of a, an NPM package called supports global. So let's take a look at that. So let's see, what is the, I'm missing something I thought I remembered about how the, to navigate this stuff. Uh, uh, where are you oh, looking for, Mark? I'm looking for uh, the chalk source code. Oh, okay, I think, um, uh, let's see, legacy to do, it doesn't have um, any chalk source code in this repository, I don't think, because it's, uh, it doesn't it's an, NPM, it's an NPM package, it won't be in. But, the, but I thought that there was a dependency thing, whatever you call it, where one. Package.json? Package .json? Yeah, but the, 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 the git link thing. Um, well, it's only in yeah you get the module thing yeah it. I'm sorry um, that only happens in clean to do because that's actually a rewrite of uh, chalk ah I see I see I see okay so this, one, this one isn't it, its only connection is in package.json and okay um, uh, so I'll ju I'll just say what I remember um, and actually I can bring it up I can do it by I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I am, I am being incoherent. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll say what I remember and Kate, you can, why don't you project the code if it's relevant? 
Uh, chalk depends on supports color. Supports color uses the process module and the OS module um, uh, in a trivial way to figure out whether it's on a platform that supports color. And um, so, uh, in so the legacy version of um, legacy of uh, the to do the 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 version of the to do that uses legacy code that uses the existing npm things um, does a require of fs which is the fs that comes from node and then minimus chalk and readline that come from npm or does readline come no readline comes from npm um, uh, and then does um, so I think um, readline is a built-in node module. Um, I can project, I, I have it open uh, locally. I can project if you'd like. Okay. Yeah, uh, 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 please do. Okay. Back to meeting. Um, let's see, is there an easy way for me to project, um, or do you have to give it up, Mark? Oh, I, stop share. I see. Okay. Yeah. I just gave it up. I, I think there's actually an option to have more people screen sharing at the same time. I just, I never, um, so. Okay. Is that sharing? Yes. We can see it. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, we're I'm I'm still uh getting my zoom legs here. It's I think we all are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um did you want to go to a specific part or um so show the place where chalk sorry, where chalk chalk uses supports color. Show the place where it supports color makes use of the globals to figure out whether the platform supports color. Okay. Let's see. The reason I'm surprised by the read line, did, did the read line happen after we added, after we, we wrote the manifest together? Um, no, I don't think I've made any changes recently. Okay. The reason why I'm puzzled by it is readline is a resource, is a resource module clearly from the job it's doing. Mm -hmm. And it's, we did not deal with it as far as I remember in the manifest. I, I'm not sure it's a resource module because you have to give it something from FS. Oh, okay. Okay, it's an interesting question. Okay, so let's take a look at this first, the, the supports color thing. Okay, um, so there's there's two uses of um, authority here, I guess you might say. There's um, the process as a, um, is that a global variable? Is that how you would describe it? And then Pro process is a global variable, yeah. And, and then OS is a, a module that's um, a built-in node module. Yes. I'm getting the release from OS. Okay, um, uh, so at this point, I think we can take a look at the manifest for legacy to do. Okay. So uh, the idea is that um, legacy to do should just run um, uh, as a, um, uh, without the manifest as something that 
uh, has the normal excess privileges, violates Polo all over the place, or when run in an SES environment with the manifest and a safe module system that honors the manifest, that the manifest uh, says for the resource modules uh, what to give each resource module and when it mentions a name, what to map that name to. Um, uh, so uh, let's take a look at supports color at the bottom on line 39. Um, so when supports color, we, 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 we recognize that there's two ways in which a resource module obtains resources um, uh, that we need to manipulate at initialization time. That I'm sorry, that it obtains resources at initialization time, which is the thing that makes it itself resource module, which is by import or require. So this is saying when supports color uh, imports OS, instead of giving it what would normally be named OS, give it the thing we're naming alt OS. And this is where there's clearly some overlap between um, uh, what we're trying to do and what the import map uh, that we were just looking at is trying to do. And we need to, at some point, think about um, uh, how these things relate to each other, but let's, let's not go into that today or not go into it now. And then the other one is uh, the globals uh, supports color. The assumption here is that each package is given its own compartment and the compartment has its own global and its own um, uh, loader. So the loader is the thing that has the, uh, the import mapping when it, has, when it says OS, give it alt OS. And the per package global, uh, uh, it populates the global variable process with the default export from the module alt process. And then all of these alt things, alt FS, alt OS, and alt process are things that we wrote uh, as uh, atten as as resource modules that are attenuations of other resources. So alt FS is an attenuation of the built-in module OS. Um, uh, I'm sorry, both FS and and um, and OS are, are the alt form is just a direct attenuation of the built-in form. And then alt process is a module whose default export is an attenuation of the value of the process global that it itself sees. Um, uh, so this manifest is trying to express a application wide uh, set of policies to give each package least authority uh, in that manner. And, and, and the presumption is that the, the attenuations themselves are expressed in these various alt packages that uh, we haven't seen yet. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Kate, can you go ahead and show us um, uh, an informative alt package? Okay. Um, so, I think we have two layers here. Um, we have the actual attenuation. Um, this one yeah. is. Less, I, I would be. Th there's a disconnect there unless you show us the alt thing first. Yeah, show us. Yeah, show the alt thing first. So the alt thing is is the reason that why there's both an attenuation uh, module and an alt module is the attenuation module is expressing the attenuation as a, um, pure, a, a pure module um, that's exporting a pure function, where the pure function goes, uh, takes an FS as an argument um, uh, and produces a, um, an, an attenuated FS. So because it's doing it all at runtime with arguments, uh, attenuate FS is itself pure, and then alt FS wraps attenuate FS uh, such that alt FS is itself a resource module because it's obtaining the resource FS and it's 
exporting the attenuated resource as the export of the module itself. So it's being a module that exports a resource it itself is a resource module. That's clear. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so now let's go back to um, uh, attenuate FS. Okay, so what's going on with this attenuate FS is uh, it's is um, uh, it's a very very special case. It's because we're starting with this simple as possible example. It's just doing the attenuation that's needed for this one example, which is to export something that looks like FS, except it only honors the requests to FS that we know this application uses, um, or, uh, which is that it um, opens a file named todo.txt, and the only things it does with that file is append to it and read from it. So with this attenuator, if the client does anything with the thing that it perceives as, as FS, that this attenuated form does not honor, uh, then it won't work. And that's the um, right way to deal with legacy, giving legacy code polar constraints by configuration uh, so that if they demand more than we've already decided to give it, we get a failure. Um, so um, can I ask a question at this uh, point? Um, so, so, so obviously it is, it is correct that when you try to use something uh, for a purpose other than what was expected, when you ask for it, then here's where you interject. Um, my, 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 my question here would be, what is the appropriate way to interject? Uh, are you going to throw uh, you're not allowed error? Or are you going to um, throw an error because the operation um, occurs on an un undefined thing? Um, because it was not um, requested, so it does not exist. Um, so, so um, yeah, we've we've um, my, so both options are possible. It's up to you know, um, uh, th this is an issue of what we want to recommend. So, so um, uh, uh, I'll give you. So I'll just start off with my recommendation, uh, which is that this thing is written the way it should be written, which is everything that it doesn't do is absent in terms of uh, method names. Uh, and for attenuations that go beyond the presence or absence of method names, uh, it throws an error. The reason why I'm suggesting that method names, uh, the absence be expressed um, uh, by actual presence or absence of the method is that existing JavaScript practice for a somewhat different purpose, but basically for dealing with um, version transitions of the platform is, is one of the main uh, purposes. Uh, JavaScript code is already used to what's called a feature testing style, which is as some API is upgraded with new features, the new features are expressed as new methods. And then code adapts to the presence or absence of features by testing for the presence or absence of the method names. This is kind of going in the reverse direction, which is rather than um, providing something with new names that something could test for, this is removing old names in a way that can be tested for. Uh, so, and that makes the, the, my recommendation unclear whether it's a good idea, uh, but that's, that's what I would recommend at this point, is to just I, express it with absence. I think that, yeah, I think there's an open design question about what the failure goals are, because if, if, if what you're trying to do in the event of a failure is to figure out what did you misconfigure in your attenuation implementation or something like that, uh, that's one thing, and that's definitely going to be a concern at development time. Um, but if it's, you tried to do something you're not supposed to do, and you shouldn't have been attempting that, 
um, because the only reason you could be attempting that is because you're up to no good. Um, and therefore, any bad thing that happens to you is fair game. So, so let me give a concrete example where uh, somebody could use the ability to feature test in a way that, we, that I believe we would all recognize as legitimate, uh, which is um, uh, in version one of um, uh, some... Well, I, 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 thought I could think of a very simple example. Okay. Is, um, um, I, I, I have this thing which I'm going to use these, these features in order to engage in some logging. Um, the logging uh, machinery is only present in my development environment um, and not in my runtime environment, my production environment. All right, that's good. That's good. If I'm given a logger, if I'm giving access to a logger, I'm going to go ahead and use it. But if I'm not given access to a logger, I don't want to, um, to fail as a result. I want to adapt to that. Um, let me give a, a somewhat different example that, uh, ha that uh, takes us through sort of the logic of um, uh, the transition between versions that uh, this whole Polo thing is trying, the Polo combined with Tofu is trying to catch, which is in version one of a module of a package, uh, let's say event stream, it's not using a particular authority foo and other people have run tofu on it and generated configurations that are not granting it foo. Uh, then in a later version of event stream, uh, let's say that a benign author decides um, uh, it would really, there's re some extra functionality that would really be a good idea that I could provide um, if I, if foo were available, but I don't want to cause Pola alerts by, from all of my current customers by simply using foo unconditionally. So what I'm going to do is adapt to its absence because the extra functionality I'm trying to provide, it's okay not to provide it. And I'd rather do that than cause a Pola alert from my existing customers. So um, that, that sounds like a, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, 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 uh, after you actually, after you. Uh, uh, that sounds like the recipe for a kind of latent um, um, malware thing where, where um, you know, it's basically the, the monster in the cage and it's constantly testing whether the cage is locked or not. Um, and as long as the cage stays locked, everything is fine. But if for some reason somebody at one day accidentally leaves the cage unlocked, the monster gets out. I think that's, I, I don't think there's any way to prevent that. Well, except that if you're, if you're able, if, if somebody, and, and this, this could be a separate pathway. If somebody is observing that, hey, the, this thing is rattling the cage a lot. Um, um, that could be a, a cause to go take a closer look at it. Okay. If, if, if you had a malicious, a skilled malicious person wanting to write a monster in a cage that is not uh, easily visible um, uh, because of the inability to statically analyze uh, JavaScript, um, uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't think it, you can, if you provide a if you provide code that was written to be a monster in a cage with the authority to be a monster, I think it's going to be a monster. I, I think that's a fair point. I, I'm just wondering if there's some um, intermediary failure mode where it looks like you're doing feature testing, but behind the scenes it's logging the fact that hey, this thing is doing a lot of feature testing. Um, but I, I don't, that's just a special case of um, something more general. And I think what you're arguing is, well, we can't detect the more general case of somebody who's really clever and subtle. Um, um, and so why bother with this special case? And, and I think there's a, a lot to that argument. Yeah. Could yeah. I share my screen just because I have, uh, I, oh, cool. I, I'm learning to write code to try to relate uh, to what's being said. So, okay. 
uh, let me try for one second. Um, I, I'm just recycling old code because I'm very lazy today. <laughs> good. It's a good, good trade to call today. Yeah, so, so that's the old example. We're done with that. But, but still, we're using trusted thing because, you know, we're working with trusted thing. Um, I, I see this as a, a feature testing versus um, try catch uh, feature testing, the inefficient way of feature yeah. testing. The so, so, so here's why try catch, in, uh, try catch as you've written it uh, is a very, very bad way to feature test, <laughs> which is it might be that the feature actually does exist and you're using it in a buggy way or the feature itself is buggy. And or, by using try catch to test, you're going to confuse the bug with the absence. Yeah, so, so, so I, I was really hoping that this example would, would um, elicit uh, such a, um, like it points to a contradiction because it's a valid approach to test for the presence of something uh, usually you do it, uh, uh, and that something is not important. People like to do un undefined. I like to, sorry, like to do this. I like to do equals function because if it's an object, it's not the trusted thing I thought it was. Um, but but here I'm 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 really try catching because trusted thing can throw because uh, because the user is not privy to using trusted thing because he's not a trusted um, user. Um, whereas I did not understand that. That, that error is related to n not, not um, attenuation uh, effect, but rather the fact that the service itself will throw an error even if trusted thing executed. So the context of me logging to the user or showing the user an effect of why that code fails in the absence of this is contextual, um, um, not, not because attenuation was thought about, but rather because trusted thing failed because of a business domain related aspect. Whereas when you do this and you're feature testing, it will look to manifesting um, of, of these kind of modules that it requires an authority which it only uh, requires if it existed. So, so I'm running out a way to make sure that when someone is feature testing, uh, they might not, not necessarily require that privilege um, is uh, becoming lost in, 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 in that. I, I love the idea that it throws uh, if it's called when it's not expected to be called. That definitely I love. Um, but the finer grain um, on how uh, someone authoring code could, could be aware that it's an attenuation and be able to write code that accommodates attenuation versus error uh, is something I, I'm failing to imagine, you know, from my perspective. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go. I have another meeting I'm being summoned to. Yeah, Jeff. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing or. Okay. So I'm. Okay. Um, I'm going to go. Uh, let's see. Um, this will stop. Okay. I'm going to share and switch to. Um, Kate's pure module. I'm sorry, clean to do. This is Kate's clean to do. And Kate's, Kate's clean to do uh, is the one that uh, has the rewritten. Oh, good. This is what I was expect. This is this is the thing that I had remembered that I was looking for, and I understand why it's only in the clean one and not the legacy one now. Okay, so uh, the clean chalk is is chalk rewritten as a pure module. The clean supports color is supports color rewritten as a pure module. Um, uh, so supports color um, as a uh, pure module 
uh, creates this pure supports color function, which it exports. So since it's only exporting a pure function, it itself is pure. Uh, it takes a OS and process, which is, which is uh, can be the attenuated OS and process, but it's taking them as arguments rather than assuming them as globals or as modules. And then it only does with those things, those things that are analogous to our previous attenuation. Now, a conversation that I had um, uh, I don't remember with whom, uh, but a conversation that I had pointed out that the clean form being shown here is actually intermediate. Yes, that was me. That was, okay, that was Brian. Um, uh, so that's, this is sort of medium clean uh, because it's still uh, assuming that, the, that we have the attenuated OS and process as opposed to rewriting the whole thing the way one would have written it for a capability language in the first place. Um, so are you referring to um, destructuring your arguments where OS is actually destructured to only refer to the, the, the things of OS that it needs? Exactly, exactly. My argument was that if you're going to convince people to rewrite their code to accept authorities as arguments rather than grabbing them as imports, then you might as well go all the way and ask them to get smaller authorities. Right. So, so if, you're, if you're writing pure supports color as a pure module in a, for an, uh, an OCAP platform uh, where all of the supporting uh, platform provided APIs were also written to support OCAP code, then you wouldn't write it to take OS and process as arguments because what it needs from them is not OS-like or process-like. So the only thing we're doing with OS is obtaining from it the release, which is a string, and then we're splitting. Oh, okay, and then, uh, and then over here, we're only using uh, OS release sub two. It look, oh, I'm sorry, OS release sub zero and sub two. Um, I don't remember what those are even anymore, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. And then process dot, so from process, we're actually using a few things. Um, and uh, so now it, it, it would become a uh, API design issue, um, uh, whether how, how these things are bundled together into some more coherent objects, uh, rather, or, or whether they are, would actually be a bunch of uh, separate parameters, which would be unwieldy. Um, uh, and this is where we were discussing last time this uh, Alan Purr's Perlis rule that if you have, um, if you're that completely aside from security or initialization, in general with an API, if you have a method uh, that has five or more parameters, you probably want to consider that a symptom of bad API design and decide how to refactor things so that there's fewer noun, noun concepts that have to pass over that API boundary. Um, uh, um, uh, so, that, that, so that's design work that I'm not proposing we, we try to go into at this point. Um, uh, now I'm gonna, um, uh, uh, let's see. Okay, so now I'm going to show my variation on Kate's module that is not, not anywhere close to as clean as what Brian is suggesting. Um, uh, but um, the main thing it's trying to do is that Kate's main here, the index dot, dot js um, uh, 
I'm sorry. Uh, not the supports collar. No, sorry. Yeah, so this thing is both doing a bunch of wiring up here that is analogous to the wiring that legacy to do expresses declaratively uh, in the manifest file. And it's also doing a bunch of startup logic in the rest of it down here. So this is uh, Kate's clean to do. Um, and Brian and Dan Connolly got into an interesting discussion about where this wiring uh, should be expressed if one is in a clean world of only pure modules. Um, and um, so, The, um, so, uh, uh, so one of the things that's pleasing about the approach we saw in the legacy uh, repository is that by pulling out all code expressing interesting logic, interesting behavioral logic into separate modules, the remaining residue of wiring of those top level modules could be expressed declaratively. Um, and it's nice that it can be expressed declaratively and, um, uh, and it's potentially uh, um, useful that we know that it's expressed in a analyzable manner. Um, but uh, I was repulsed by the idea that JSON would still be the right way to write down that declarative wiring uh, because all the declarative wiring is expressing is basically um, uh, uh, scoping and function call. Um, and uh, so I wrote um, this thing with a pure index that is basically just using a subset of Jesse uh, that essentially can just can just can just expresses um, uh, scoping and uh, function calls uh, and the export of a pure function that takes two arguments auth require and auth global, uh, where, where uh, here's where we still have an issue of bridging to the legacy platform, which is uh, any capability programming language has to cope with the issue of how to represent the process's initial authority. And um, uh, uh, Daria, if you're still on, um, uh, yeah, I see you are. I uh, very much um, uh, uh, like your feedback about how uh, uh, Wyvern copes with the initial authority problem. Uh, but uh, let, let me explain this one first. So over here, I'm assuming that we're still in a node environment in which all of the uh, initial authority um, is uh, expressed uh, with either a place to import modules from, i.e. something like require, or a global that contains global bindings. Uh, and it's actually, it shouldn't, that's not necessarily node-like. This is, this is also true in the browser. Where, uh, where all of the authority is expressed by things on the genuine global. So the idea here is that the main of an object capability language run on a legacy platform, and this was true for E and for Joey, 
starts off with um, uh, some abstraction of all of the permissions that POSIX grants a process running under POSIX. Uh, and that's enough stuff that it has, that it's usually expressed in some kind of namespacing. And then what it does is uh, it imports the top level modules, it attenuates, uh, uh, it obtains some of those initial authorities uh, by using the namespace packaging of those initial authorities, it attenuates them, and then it wires up the attenuated authorities and the, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the application of um, the initial module functions, the pure functions to make module instances and wires all of that together. So that's what uh, this code is showing, um, and um, uh, Daria, have you have you guys faced this with Wyvern? Uh, yes, we did. Our solution was well. So far, we were either having a main module, so where everything starts, or um, having having a module that is the main for the application, and then that module starts on the top level, and then all of this. Um, the distribution of authorities happening inside that other module. So it, what is the representation of the authority that the main is given so that it can attenuate and wire from there? On the top level, that would be our require. Inside a main module for the application, it would be that that module as a parameter gets an object which gives access a, well, we call it like a job or whatever the platform is. And then from that, uh, anyone could import whatever parts of Java that they need. So we get- Oh, oh right. Wyvern runs on the JVM? Yeah. Okay. Did you look at the taming work for the JVM that was done by both E and Joey? I'm not sure what exactly you're referring to, maybe. Okay. Um, so. And the paper, just the, would it was be described in the paper on Joey? It would be described in the paper on Joey. Then, um, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, does this, so, so, um, so this pure index, most of this is wiring of stuff we've already seen before because it was expressed uh, in, a di in a similar form uh, in the manifest. Um, it doesn't, ha there are no alt hyphen OS or alt hyphen processes, just the pure attenuate ones. Um, the attenuate FS here, by the way, I've made it more reusable by passing into it the name that it should allow rather than having it be specific to the name that it's allowing. Um, uh, and I've also taken a step towards Brian's suggestion with passing to Pure Support Scholar not an attenuated OS, but just passing it directly os.release, which I misspelled. Um, and uh, then uh, separately, I've, I've also taken the remainder of index.js, which is um, in common with the legacy form, which is the behavioral startup, and I've pulled it out into a pure main, passing such that it's itself now expressed in a pure manner, and am passing it the part of the wiring that it needs, um, noticing that there's another thing that I was getting, that we were getting from process that we were also not being explicit about, which is the argv. And somehow, again, I completely missed the read line. I don't know how I did that. Um, so pure main is now just a function of a FS a, um, which is um, the, the same form of attenuated FS that we were seeing, but now made um, by a more reusable attenuator. Um, uh, 
the, but the explicitly the argv ex extracted from process rather than a purified process. Um, uh, and over here, the chalk is the attenuated, um, is, is um, the purified chalk that, um, made by obtaining the, the chalk making function from the chalk module. This is the pure function that when applied to a, um, um, a supports color instance produces a chalk instance uh, where the chalk. Um, uh, so, um, so the other thing I'd like to um, So does Wyvern think about the, the top level wiring and the initialization behavior in a separate manner, manner like we're seeing here or in more like the clean to do index uh, in Kate's repository like we're seeing here? E did it much more like Kate was doing it. So the difference between those, so what exactly is the difference? I see that here there are more methods. It is kind of combined with the code that is executed. Is that the main difference? That's the main difference. That's the main difference is we, we did really didn't have in mind that we wanted to do a separate um, declarative expression of the wiring so that we could build tools that made use of the um, the simpler nature of what the wiring was expressing as opposed to the uh, undecidable nature of what general code expresses. Could I, could I also point out a fundamental um, behavioral um, difference between the two? Um, wrapping the instantiation of a module as a function means that just that module being referred to does not instantiate what it would be exporting but only exposes the factory of that module and um and and when we talk about um the semantics for static uh, imports um in esm you know moving this out of require um, this is fundamentally separating, um, um, you know, um, what would be an instantiated instance of an ESM module um, from it being just statically resolved, but still could actually throw an error when it's being instantiated outside of the uh, resolution graph um, um, of, of the static resolution that is taking place. Uh, I think the answer to your question is yes, uh, but to clarify, let me see if I can restate it. And you, you can tell me if I'm restating. Uh, I'm sure uh, it's going to be better than what I said. So <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. Uh, the, uh, so in, in moving to pure from, from resource modules like the legacy to do was dealing with, to the pure modules, like we're seeing both in Kate's clean to do and in my variation, uh, the fundamental thing is that uh, independent of whether it's expressed with require uh, and exports or whether it's expressed with import and export, um, uh, independent of that, uh, that all values exported uh, are pure values um, or more accurately, all values being exported are purifiable values uh, such that all values being imported are pure under the assumption of a pure loader. Uh, um, but but the, the, the important thing is that we're only expressing pure values. Our modules are only trying to, to express pure values. Uh, and then all of the wiring up of anything that's impure, uh, sorry, that's, that's, um, that's a resource that, that is able to cause effects or that contains mutable state. All of that wiring is now 
reduced to the previously solved problem of just objects invoking each other, just, just you know, just runtime uh, parameter passing. Um, uh, that it's not, that, that there's a phase of that that happens at initialization time, um, but there's nothing fundamental that differs between initialization time and the further runtime that follows initialization time. It's just things invoking other things dynamically, no longer statically. Yeah, that, that's a really good way to frame it, obviously. Um, I wouldn't be able to do that, but uh, I think the, the one thing we learned in, in working on Node.js modules is it seems very intuitive that um, because this uh, uh, you know, works out well with require, being that require is, is all synchronous code, locating and instantiating is all happening synchronously. Uh, but when you try to instantiate um, what would be a require module in, a, in a, an ESM graph, um, you hit so many different um, and unexpected um, uh, problems uh, in trying to decide when is the right order of actually evaluating the synchronous body of this require module relative to what now has become a synchronously uh, instantiated module records. Um, and, and, and the problem now is, is not, not, um, not just, um, you know, it, it's actually compounded when you're trying to do interop uh, where uh, it will be transparent to use ESM uh, imported things in, re in a require fashion or, or the more practical one, which is the opposite. You would be able to import uh, a common JS module uh, into an ESM one. So, so I'm, I'm just pointing out that um, it's, it's a little bit unintuitive um, that that uh, the kind of trouble you can come into um, when you rely on on how things work with require, um, as has been shown, trying to create some um, you know uh, trying to to do this with ESM, you know, bringing the support for ESM and, and Node.js showed that. So um, I'll, let me, let me separate two issues here. Uh, forgetting safe modules, forgetting distinguishing pure versus resource, just in the transition from uh, common JS to ESM, um, if in the common JS, all of your requires were statically analyzable, were, were things where the argument was just a literal string, um, then the transition to ESM where they all become import statements with explicit module names uh, uh, is sort of the, the, pa the path that we've, we've um, uh, tried to make straightforward. Um, uh, there is an extra phasing on ESM, which is all of the scoping between export, you know, the scope wiring between the exports and imports all happen before the modules are evaluated, the top level of the modules are evaluated. Yeah, linking or binding is, is, is usually words uh, associated with this phase. But, but it all still, but, but, but the, the value, what, obtain, given that you can calculate, that you know the transitive closure of all of the synchronous dependencies because, and something you can know if all of them are expressed only with literal strings. So the idea with the ESM semantics is that the only thing that needs to be asynchronous is to gather together into the local platform, the, all of the sources of all of the synchronous dependencies, the, the transitive synchronous dependencies. 
Uh, once you've got all of those sources, then in a single synchronous manner, you can wire up all of their scopes and then evaluate all of the initializations. Uh, there doesn't need to be any more asynchrony once all of the sources are local. It's only the import expression uh, that introduces asynchrony into any of this. And the import expression, basically, uh, uh, the new thing that it loads in a later turn is itself internally subject to exactly the same logic. It, it, it itself doesn't happen until all of the transitive dependencies are all gathered together so all of the initialization can happen in one synchronous turn. That, that is a very, very important distinction. Um, and, and it does um, um, solve at least uh, transparent, no, like one-sided interop. You know, importing named um, common JS exports uh, that are uh, statically uh, or declaratively uh, predetermined before the execution of the synchronous code uh, is solved by looking at the problem of uh, evaluation as an after effect of all the asynchronous resolution that needs to take place. Um, that is that is really where um, um, Node.js um, hit, you know, that's the end of, of what Node.js uh, was able to address so far uh, and dealing with the other side of this, but, you know, people want to also import a package and not know that it has been upgraded to ESM and they want to do that requiring it. So, so how do you do the opposite of that? And that is where things start to get very messy uh, because um, this and the fact that um, in reality, common JS uh, exports are a dynamically declared thing as a side effect of the code that actually runs, um, that, that, that is a, you know, a given here. Uh, so mm -hmm. those two things have been problematic. Um, so as it relates to the code here in this particular example, um, I think wrapping everything as a function um, that requires to be executed synchronously um, to evaluate dependencies uh, for modules before those modules are evaluated are a very clean way to, to draw the line between what is an asynchronous graph operation that can fail the entire graph and what is a synchronous operation that um, will only fail after the entire graph did not fail um, um, being located at, the, you know, at this point. Um, well, Mark, I'd like to answer your question about how this is done in Wyvern. Yes, please. So in Wyvern, maybe I'm missing some details, but to me, it looks like in Wyvern, we could do either way and both of them would work. Yes. One important thing to point out here, I think, is that Wyvern is statically typed. Ah. So, <laughs> it's a bit different. Okay, so good. Let's, let's take a look at um, uh, this form where I'm pulling out all of the wiring into a small subset of language. Um, so if I were to try to adopt this style in Wyvern, I could only do that if the separation of my main into a pure index and a pure main, uh, if both of the pure index and the pure main could still be statically typed. Is that a question? <laughs> yes. Could you please restate it? Because I'm not sure I, I understood. Okay, so the, the, the question is uh, really whether this would be a viable split in Wyvern. So I take it in Wyvern right now, the practice is, is more analogous to uh, Kate's index JS, where the wiring and the initial behavioral initialization um, uh, is mixed together in one main file, one, one main module. So that, that's the first question for Wyvern. 
uh, it was the it, we did have that mixing in both E and Joey. Could you please show again the other version? Yeah. So in the other version, we've got two files, uh, two modules. There's pure index.js that just expresses uh, the top level wiring and is following a discipline of staying within a very, very small subset of JavaScript for which there's, there's uh, as long as you're guaranteed that you're in that subset, there's a lot of, of, of you know, things you could, you could derive from this in a reliable manner without worrying about running into arbitrary code uh, versus a pure main.js, which was the thing that pure index was calling at the end that exports a pure module that um, uh, just takes the particular things that pure index wires up to it. I think in Wyvern, both versions would be possible. Okay, so there would be no problem typing the the initialization logic uh, after splitting it into those two components. Yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, and uh, you guys with Wyvern have actually been doing a lot of static analysis, um, both with regard to uh, conventional static typing as well as uh, the mixture of capability reasoning and effects typing. Um, right. uh, so, uh, so would this split do anything for you? Is there anything attractive about expressing the top level logic uh, in this split way or are we just um, uh, Is, is this a useful separation? Maybe, but I'm not sure. I would need to think a bit more and more carefully about this. Okay. Um, I don't know if it helps, but TypeScript has um, built a lot of mo uh, momentum in, in um, statically uh, uh, typing JavaScript files recently. So, so it used to be TypeScript only um, liked TypeScript files, but they've done a lot of work to actually bring um, type support to JS files in the past two years. Um, and it has been very, very, um, like it's, it's been surprisingly accurate with very little type um, annotations, JS docs. Um, to actually be able to infer what you're doing here with pure index. Okay, so uh, so uh, I don't have any experience with TypeScript. Um, uh, Michael Fig is also using TypeScript to do his Jesse and Jessica work. He's basically writing TypeScript that expands into only Jesse code. Uh, um, uh, so uh, um, from your experience with TypeScript, do does both the index.js in Kate's repository and the split pure index, uh, pure main in my repository, both look equally typable with TypeScript? So I, I, so I see this code in front of me right now, and I think TypeScript uh, would be able to statically analyze this format. Uh, can I see the other code just for a second? Yeah, sure. Uh, to try to you know, compare with more context. Yeah. Um, I, again, I don't see anything in here that is uh, going to make TypeScript uh, choke, other than the fact that because because you have a lot of um, uh, functions here in this in this file, like arrow functions, that have arguments that are not being um, uh, predictably typed. So there's no implicit type for to do. It's type any. Um, so maybe it would take some additional type annotations here um, that will allow TypeScript to say that if to do is only expected to be of type string, I take it, 
then, um, then um, it will actually start to statically infer uh, and maybe even outline if you're using to do in a context that is um, not allowed for a string, which I, I don't think there is much um, to worry about. But but okay, let's let's take let's stay with that example. Okay. So um, so in my form, that function got moved into pure main. All right. And in pure main, it appears right over here on line eighteen. Yeah. So since this is a function that is not uh, previously uh, imported from a package that probably comes with, with type definitions, um, TypeScript would want you to say that to do is not any, it's something specifically. Um, but that's how TypeScript was designed. TypeScript was designed to only infer from what it knows. Uh, it does not necessarily, I don't think that it, it infers to do to be a string because you used it in a, in a template string. Uh, it just, it, it would just infer that it would be coercible to a string at the very least, e e if it even did that. I think it will likely infer to do to be statically typed as any. Um, so without type annotations here, both formats would be, um, or with or without type annotations, both both splits uh, would behave the same uh, for TypeScript. That's that's my conclusion. Really. Okay, so so from sounds like from from the TypeScript would also not distinguish between the two clean styles here. Yeah, both of them will will require the same amount of uh, of um, additional work, the exact okay. same additional annotations. For TypeScript to function here, so if if we're talking about a typing static typing mechanism other than TypeScript that does not require the padding, um, uh, then it will likely behave the same way okay. uh, in, in both styles. Uh, and I could be wrong. Okay. So I actually I thought about this a bit more. I think in Wyvern the second version, the version that Mark wrote, would be beneficial because. If you put everything at the top level, so we care about what kind of authority, what kind of um, resources each module could access. So if it's written the first way, when everything kind of bunched together along with all the methods, so it's not that useful because we look at the main and we know that main has access to all resources. So there's not much that we can say about it, right? It's just, yeah, we have access to everything. If you put it in a separate module, then the number of resources that that module can access, in this case, say the pure main, right? So now we can see that there are only three specific resources that can be accessed. So that kind of narrows the scope. And then it's, it should be easier to reason about the program in that way. Because now we, if there is a method that is called from pure main, it could use only one resource and not all of them. And then we also know from the beginning that pure main has access only to three particular resources and not everything. Okay, good, good. Uh, so um, uh, let, let, me, um, let me try uh, restating that in a way. Um, the, may, the, 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 real, the, the startup uh, logic has to be given tremendous amounts of authority, and therefore the startup logic is itself a point of tremendous vulnerability if we misunderstand what it's doing. Uh, and therefore, we would like the startup logic to be analyzable with confidence. Um, so by pulling all the behavioral logic, which is arbitrary code, which is therefore um, runs into all the undecidability properties that prevent us from re reasoning about code with confidence, if we pull all of those out to separate modules that are wired together, and then the residue we're left with is in a, a very decidable language that we can reason about with confidence, then um, uh, the vulnerability to the handling of a tremendous amount of authority um, uh, is where we can reason. And then by the time we've gotten even to pure main, we've already gotten to much less authority and therefore much less risk. 
Yes, I think that's a fair statement. Brian is looking skeptical. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out what I think about this, it, or how to express what my anxiety is about it. Part of what I was expressing to Mark the other day, there's kind of a, a top-down versus bottom-up um, issue here. And I keep thinking about what the ecosystem looks like. How is the work done to analyze any one of these attenuations going to be shared from one program to another? And doing everything up at the top level here, it feels like the size of this, this startup wiring thing is going to scale linearly with the total amount of code in any given application. And it feels like the author of the application is the one responsible for doing all of that work that there's not in this approach a good way of sharing that or delegating that to to somebody else who has done a subset of the work already um and a thing but i guess a lot of it depends upon this top level wiring who's who's writing this is a human writing this or is this sort of gleaned together from uh, synthesized from annotations and all of the other modules to indicate what kind of authority they want or what kind of authority they're offering. Um, so, so in, uh, when I wrote this, the only thing I had in mind was that the application author writes this, but I also had in mind that there is a modularity here in that, uh, this is only the wiring that needs to be expressed in terms of top level modules. And, or top level packages, top level whatever, you know, units, whatever those units are, are called. And then within a unit that internally contains subunits that are nobody's business, that are really considered to be um, uh, uh, just the business of the author of that unit, that it contains particular subunits, that it could contain similar wiring logic for further dividing the authority that it's, that it's giving that it's given uh, for further subdividing it and handing it out to subunits that are purely internal to it. And I want to call, call example a very nice concrete, a very nice concrete example of this, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, uh, chalk versus supports color. There's two ways within this formalism, and, and there's actually an earlier, I don't remember if it was a committed version, but there's an earlier version of this code that used the other form. There's a policy decision, which is, is it up to to do to create a supports color that it gives to chalk? Or uh, is it up to chalk to, ex to accept a release and a attenuated process and uh, where only chalk knows that it's making use of that for purposes of creating a supports collar. Mm -hmm. And in the second case, it would be top level wiring within the chalk module that instanti instantiates the supports collar module. And however, it means that the application, that it means that chalk's least authority is now includes the least authority that supports color demands because it's now responsible for instantiating the supports color that it needs. Whereas uh, in writing it this way, chalk's least authority is much lower and the least authority of supports color is the larger least authority of these two things. And it's, and it's, um, and therefore the policy expression by the application author knows that it's dealing with a less dangerous chalk because some of the danger has been partitioned at its level into supports call. Yeah, so you're pushing the, the power and the responsibility for doing the attenuation correctly from one place to another. Right, and th there's a, both styles are called for. I would say the style we're seeing here is what I think of as the uh, jetpack style. I just for, for context here, uh, Brian did work on a least authority module system for Firefox extensions named Jetpack, um, uh, and it was very much what I think of. Well, let me, what I mean by 
I think of this style as the jetpack style, is that the um, attenuation and the attenuated form were created outside the module that was given the attenuated form. Yeah. And uh, the other form that I was mentioning where pure chalk would be invoked with OS release and alt process, and then, then it would be purely internal to it that it would use those to instantiate supports color and then make use of that is more like the style I was using in E where uh, responsibility was more subdivided um, uh, and, and the further division of authority was happening down the hierarchy. It was less flattened out into a top level. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I should send out pointers to the write-up that I did on the, on the Jetpack work because it's, it's really what shapes my thinking every time we, we talk about this stuff. Um, and in that one, modules are indicating what they want with regular import statements. And there's a, an, an auditor of some sort. There's an, um, in the case of Firefox add-ons, there are reviewers that decide whether something should be published in the gallery or not. And they're the ones that have the responsibility of making sure this add-on is going to make people happy. You know, they read a description of what it's going to do and they want to know it's really going to do that and not something else surprising. And, and, and in that world, there's, you know, the end user that ultimately has the power over their computer and what software they run, but they're delegating a lot of that authority off to somebody like the, the add-on gallery reviewers in that they're, they're getting this trusted statement from those reviewers that says, if you install this add-on, it will behave in this particular way. And that uh, conclusion is drawn by an, analyzing the modules. And a lot of the work of trying to attenuate these modules is to reduce the amount of work the, the an analysis, I mean, not bleh, the auditors have to do and to let them amortize that over multiple add-ons that share the same components. And it's that, that sharing, you know, in, in this scenario, it's it, it, that Mark is showing, it is an application author that is making the decisions about how these things are wired together. Um, there's, there's not as obvious a spot here for a, a gallery uh, reviewer to go and um, come to some conclusions about something. And I'm trying to figure out how to, how to apply my, my, my mental model of the Jetpack world to this thing. Um, can I? My, go ahead. I know, can I go afterwards? Because that's, how, that's where I was trying to take this mentally all along. Yeah. And I've written one example that I want to complete um, um, that is very ridiculous, honestly. But, but, but if, if you, when you're done, okay? Just yeah, have, yeah. Uh, please, actually, Mark, let me just have you, um, can you do a, a search for um, uh, GitHub Jetpack module, Warner? Or, or GitHub, yeah, github.com slash Warner. Um, I just want to make the URL available to folks so you can take a look at my write-up. And it's somewhere under that. Uh, yeah, go to, yeah, search there for, for Jetpack. Jetpack, Jetpack components? components, that's it. Okay, good. And I'll paste this into the chat. So, so figure out how to do that. Uh, just make sure to everyone, it, it, it says to everyone, not privately. How, so I don't <laughs> actually see the chat control. Is it under more? Look under more. Chat. Top chat. One. Okay. No, we, we see anything in, in vacuum. It's, it's kind of weird to see the pointer, you know, and you guys are discussing where the pointer is and all we see is clicking in air, basically. Oh, okay. it's not showing the zoom menus on the no. show. <laughs> no. Okay. So um, yeah, so so this there are a couple of of uh, uh, write ups I did here, and this was a long time ago. You know, this was actually two thousand ten or so. Um, Is there some place you'd like me to go over here? Um, no, I, 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 folks, take a look at this offline. Uh, this will explain a lot of my thinking. But uh, go ahead, Sala. Uh, Sala, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I was actually muted and, and started talking. So. Uh, uh, so, um, so I, I know that we don't like to think of things that are not standard syntax, but I, I, I was thinking of this ridiculous idea that I, I'm importing FS, right? Let's, let's change this to FS, right? 
Um, and because I'm using require syntax, this actually looks like uh, looks like this. And without code analysis, um, I don't know what I'm what this particular module is wanting to do with FS. So we use uh, AST based analysis to try to infer when uh, FS dot um, you know, let's change this uh, to read file. Uh, so that fs.read file is actually the only thing I'm going to be using. Um, but then, um, you know, I could, I could also be using the read file async because I prefer that. Uh, it's a new thing, which I'm not sure. Um, um, is that much async? It's only promise async versus um, the async, the conventional async of FS. Um, and and require code without without analyzing to actually make sure that you catch every single reference that will hit FS even indirectly for static typing. That that's that's critical because not all references to FS will be this clean. Uh, FS can be mangled and passed around and, you know, which, which one is it kind of thing. And eventually, uh, so, so you need really good um, um, uh, static analysis of code to infer what would have been maybe a declarative optional thing that, that would not exist today, obviously, but would have told us uh, that the only thing we want from FS is that particular member. Um, I'm declaring as a module that I don't need any more authority th than this. Um, and so, so I, I was actually making the analogy that the star that we have today could also be, you know, maybe that stylistically that doesn't look right but could have also been a declarative way for a module that saying that the only thing it really needs from FS is this, um, because in reality, this is more similar to the required code than this. Um, because FS is not a, an ESM module, um, this code is not binding to read file. It's actually, um, or actually this code here, is not the same thing as this code. Because if the value of read file changed over time in, in FS itself, here it will be updated, and here it will not. So, so I, I don't know if it's, um, if it's going in, in a direction that, that, that helps at this point? Well, I don't understand the syntax on line two. Uh, require, this is a hypothetical require that takes a second argument? Yeah, if somehow we were able to tell that this particular require is only interested in a name, then this code here um, would be um, attenuated not just because we had to analyze the code, but because the module declared its intent. Now that doesn't exist in reality, but uh, so, 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 so the, the just mechanism-wise, this requ this hypothetical require with two arguments. Yeah. What does the second argument mean? The second argument is saying that I don't need everything from FS to be in FS. I only need those two. So it's just saying that we so, don't have so, so, uh, so, yeah. So. so the FS that, that this hypothetical require is returning is not the original FS, but rather an object that, that like the original FS, but with only these two methods. Is that correct? Yes. Um, here, the important distinction I'm trying to get at is that um, whoever makes FS is best suited to make attenuation decisions on behalf of FS. Um, obviously, the second best person is someone qualified to do that uh, as a third party. Um, but 
but we we cannot assume that most people are are willing to allow third party attenuation on their behalf um because I know it makes sense, but if we're talking down the road that you're attenuating globals that are now being STD modules, um, that, that will have to be revisited. Who has authority to attenuate the modules um, and, and do it in a, in a way that is actually, um, you know, not impeding the behavior of that module? So my assumption is that it's universally good practice in object capability systems and in general part of what object capability systems are about is that for any authority you have, you can build a virtualization of it that is whatever attenuation of it you'd like to express, then uh, provide that attenuation rather than the original. Um, uh, and there's, there, there is, you know, we could talk about um, uh, 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 branding or trademarking and nominal typing as um, uh, ways to check that something is, the, is a genuine original of it. But that's the exception rather than the rule. The, the, the general rule should be that everything is virtualizable and attenuatable. I, I think that a way to think of this is about, so you have code written by person A, and at some point in the future, that code is going to interact with code written by person B. And they each have some interests, they each have some agency, they each have some, some communication channels they have ahead of time but then you kind of send the programs off on their way and sooner or later they run into each other and whatever happens, happens. Um, and and I, I keep thinking about, you know, who, who has the motivation to, to improve the security of these things? And person A is giving power to, the code written by person A is giving power to the code written by person B. Um, and at what point do they get to, 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 um, to, to have agency about how much power they're actually giving to them? Um, one, one problem I have with this approach that you're showing here is, at least in, in the Jetpack world, I didn't assume that there would be any useful attenuation to be had on a smaller, smaller than a module basis. Like, I guess a module could be specifically designed to export two different things as a sort of convenient bundling of them. But I was hoping that people would write two, two modules in that case. Um, and, and so you, you, you get access to a module or you don't. And we don't try to go and figure out what you're using from the module in order to apply kind of automatic attenuation. So, so I, I want to interject here that uh, when you say only modules, you're really speaking about initialization time. Is there sort of this initial configuration, initialization of things? Mm -hmm. Because once you're running and objects and functions are invoking other objects and functions, mm -hmm. then basically every encapsulating abstraction Mm -hmm. is an attenuation of some sort. Yeah, okay. Yep. That, it's, that it's pervasive and it's per object, not... Um, yeah, and, and, and we want that. We want to encourage people to do that kind of dynamic runtime uh, attenuation of stuff. Right, okay. For sure. Um, so, I mean, a, a bunch of this, in the Jetpack con uh, context, it was, uh, here's a configuration of code. What can we say about it that will improve the safety properties or improve the chances that it's going to do what the end user wants it to do. And what, what you have access to at that time is um, the wiring between these different modules and conclusions that have been drawn about the behavior of those modules that somebody else wrote down the last time they analyzed an application that shared some modules with this new one that you're looking at. So, so I was very focused on figuring out how to um, record those decisions in a way that they could be reapplied usefully uh, on the next pass. And, and that's why I kind of went for stuff with a, a declarative manifest that was pointing at, at modules as the top level objects. Um, when, when you have an opportunity to look at the behavior of some code, then you can make more fine grained decisions. But if those decisions can't be saved and used again on something that mostly overlaps with the current one, then, then you can't amortize that work. You can't amortize that analysis work and take advantage of it again later. Yeah, I, I definitely appreciate um, this um, 
fine detail of it that when you attenuate a module uh, similarly, you don't want to keep on incurring the same cost. Is that a good way to? to yeah, I mean, you know, you, you think about this, you might think about this as, um, I'm thinking about running a program that somebody has supplied to me. I go to my local expert and I say, please review this program and tell me whether it's going to do what I want it to do. Does it represent a risk? Is it going to, to do something against my wishes? And then tomorrow, I have another program that has a lot of overlap with this one. Do I need to tell my expert to do all of that same work again? Is there anything that they can, can reuse from, from the previous day's work? If a second person comes along and reviews the same program, um, how much how much does that analysis um, can, how much can that reuse? Um, and and how do you spread this work out among a community of people? You know, a lot of the focus at Mozilla was about taking advantage of the power of the community to improve the the quality of software for everybody. Um, so a lot of the the design work was around this um, uh, a, a, a tool that all of these um, reviewers, the, the gallery uh, maintainers, could use to share their conclusions about the components that went into the gallery um, and encourage people to go and reuse stuff because it had already been reviewed and, and, and meet it, met some, some description of what it was supposed to do. And those reviewers should be able to push back and they can say, yes, you know, this chalk module does what it says it's supposed to do, but it'd be even better if it were depending upon something smaller um, than, than the full scale OS module. And it might be that the OS module is designed to be partitioned in that way. And so the attenuation is as simple as saying chalk should only get this one property from the OS module. Um, but I, I guess I didn't assume that most modules would be broken up in that fashion. And so I figured somebody would have to go and write a, a one or two line wrapper program, wrapper module around the OS module that only exposes the one property. Um, and, then, and then that makes it, once that's in a module, then that's now visible in this analysis tool. And, and somebody can say, oh, any application that only needs to know, that, that's dependent upon the OS module, but it really only needs to know the name of the platform that you're on, should really be depending upon this other thing. Um, and then that's the sort of uh, uh, search query you ought to be able to apply the database that this analysis tool is providing to say, oh, what are other modules that are, are using this big one? Let's go and look at them to find out what they really need and then go and suggest to their authors that they should pull in less. So, so I, I, I do have one question um, at this point to, to take it back to the example where we were really having a, uh, a factory of the module uh, in the form of a function be, uh, be um, exported by a module uh, so that it's instantiated um, um, in the place where the module should be instantiated. Um, so I, my concern with this uh, model is that you can potentially instantiate the same module more than once and that the side effects of an instantiation is not necessarily meant to be um, a reoccurring um, behavior uh, on all aspects for all modules. Uh, so, so it's not just the duplication of work. Let's assume I'm, I'm thinking here duplication in terms of duplicating the effort in the same runtime and creating multiple instances of the same resource, but rather multiple occurrences of the side effect because the factory is um, called more than once. So I think so. I think it's a feature of object capability systems uh, that you can't write anything that is instantiable but not multiply instantiable. Um, uh, uh, or the, the way Kevin Kenton Varda puts it is. There are no singletons. Um, uh, uh, however, if you multiply instantiate something, then you've got the identity discontinuity problems. Uh, if the, the world of one instance interacts with the world of another instance. So for example, uh, if a 
one of the one of the things that's within um, the making function is a class declaration. Then every time you invoke the making function, you're reevaluating the class declaration. You get a distinct class, and instances of one of those classes is not an instance of the other. If you move the class, if the class is pure, and therefore you can move it outside the making function, then you can avoid the identity discontinuity um, because they all have the same identity. But it's still the case that anything stateful must be multiply instantiable. Um, uh, so that was that was the case in E. I argued for that being the case in uh, ECMAScript modules, the original form of the uh, Chris Kowal Ihabawad proposal for standard modules that became common JS modules did have this multiple instantiation aspect to it. I mean, I guess the the benefit of making a function pure and, you know, if a module only exports a pure function, then from an authority analysis point of view, you could ignore it, right? It, it can't add any new authorities. Um, from a behavior analysis point of view, it's still useful to look, look at that module, figure out what it's going to do, write down a note about what it's going to do, and then use that note again tomorrow when you're reviewing something that's using that same module again. So it's, it's still nice that it has an identity that you can reference even though it doesn't have any, it doesn't come with any authority. Um, if, if your module graph is built up of resource modules that are each providing some authority to anybody who manages to import them, then that's a bit of this, this graph that the analyst can, can pay attention to and record. And then when they have one module that imports a couple of resource modules and has a note that says, I claim that I am attenuating the authority of these other modules to produce some new product that, a, that, that another module above me can consume. Um, that's another kind of analysis you can do and you can, you, can, you can check that off as saying, yes, yes, based on my understanding of this code, this particular module will provide the limited authority it claims it will. Um, and that becomes a bit harder to work with if all that thing is doing is providing a pure function because yes, it doesn't have any authority, which means wherever you're going to do the analysis about who gets that authority, that analysis has to happen somewhere else. And that analysis may be taking place inside a parent module that's invoking the pure function and rearranging it somehow, um, which, which means it's not getting its authority from the pure module, it's getting it from something else, probably something bigger with higher amounts of authority to it. So it's kind of like you, 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 things are now more coarse and you don't have as many different places to go and write down these notes about what the behavior was. So the concerns that you're trying to address don't, all of those concerns are not just concerns at initialization time among modules. Uh, community review is just as relevant to say the following class that only exists at runtime or the following function that only exists at runtime has parameters that are asking for objects that are much more capable than what it actually needs. And mm -hmm. it should actually be asking for this much more limited uh, uh, yeah. you know, type yeah, that's of correct. thing. That's correct. So, um, so, so the, 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 the hypothesis that I'm pursuing here is that um, given that um, initialization is pure, uh, which was very much the, you know, the E, Joey, and Wyvern way, that all subdivision of authority is now happening at runtime, and all of the issues of concern about it are not fundamentally different than the similar kinds of concern that happen later at runtime. Okay. And the same community review of the division of authority that happens in initialization uh, and the demand for, for authority that needs to be accommodated at initialization um, uh, should, is, is not fundamentally different than the community review of APIs in general, uh, both what is provided and what is demanded. I, I think that's right. I, I don't, I don't currently know how to, how to, had a reason about how to do that review. 
when the asks, you know, the, the, what does a given piece of code, um, what does its author want to get access to, or what does the author believe their code needs to, to do the job that its claim is going to do. Um, so, so Mark and I have a, have a diagram on the board here that talks about, I'm trying to turn into a blog post about four different ways of providing authority to a piece of code. And one of the axes is whether this is provided as a, as a global, um, uh, can we see it with the camera? Um, not easily. Uh, um, never mind. Way to do that in, from from inside Zoom. Well, if you were to turn your camera back on and point your laptop at the whiteboard. I, um, oh, I see. Right, I can do that. But but take a picture and 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 screen share that picture, if it's if it's easier. If there's anything you, you know, on the board that is. Uh, no. Yeah. Um, the the. One, one, one way to give authority into a program is to pass it as arguments into a function. There's another way in which you simply make global variables uh, available to it. And you know, that's what we typically think of as endowments for CES. Um, and then the other axis is that instead of uh, expecting to see a certain set of names or a certain set of arguments, you have something a bit more interactive. And so you either um, get a require name and then you call require with with strings that indicate what it is you want or the the fourth category we call that a power box and that means you get an argument to your function and you invoke uh that argument with some names that indicate what sort of authority you want yeah um, I, I took a screenshot so you don't have to keep holding it thank you though <laughs> um so so i'm trying to turn that into a blog post because it, it kind of ties into what you know we're doing with cess and, and patterns for instantiating these things and what i'm kind of recognizing is that um there are there are some of the ways of asking for authority are more statically obvious than others and there's this this but importing um you, you were uh cut off for a second there could, could you just yeah I, microphone. um some you're cut off again what what module you want is because that's what developers have to do anyway sorry so, I, I i'm just laughing because that was like a forest gum moment there yeah uh, you didn't hear anything <laughs> oh, oh. can you hear me now uh yeah we can uh, as soon as you start talking it's gonna cut off again i'm sure <laughs> oh dear okay um are we on the right microphone yeah, we're, we're good let's try and uh i'll uh, take down my thumbs up uh, if, if we can't hear you, which which is happening now, easier to spot statically than others, and if you are, so so the reason that that Jetpack uh, used require state. No, can't hear you. Total Forrest Gump. I love that you phrased it that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was laughing and then I tried not to laugh as I unmuted. So I had to explain what was going on. Uh, we, we can't hear you though. Uh, thumbs down. Uh, that's in the participants uh, list. I, I, I do emojis. I, try I see to... that now, yeah. Ah. Um, should I try to write this up so we can talk about it some other time? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, that sounds great. So, so the question I'll just leave, uh, with, you know, uh, with everyone to consider is: I have one concern about uh, a, a module factory being a function like any other function that can be executed like any other function. I'm I'm not against the idea of of an, a factory. I I just think always of if this factory is called in the wrong way, and that actually does happen when we don't mean to for it to happen. Um, what consequences can can occur from a function that can be oh. executed? Uh, we we, we can... missed the last thirty seconds. We're going to mute here while you're talking. Okay. <laughs> All right. So so I just have a concern. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I have my thumbs up because I can hear yeah. me. Okay. Um, my my concern is that when a function goes uh, somewhere it shouldn't and gets executed. 
a module factory is unlike other code functions and it's being um, mistakenly invoked elsewhere is a uh, very risky territory um, uh, but it's not necessarily wrong to have module factories it's just maybe i'm 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 worried about wrongly invoked module factories not being as damaging as wrongly invoked functions that are not uh, I'm sorry, okay we are um uh, uh Sally, you got cut off again most of that answer i didn't i only heard a syllable at the end um so i think i think zoom uh, should really fund me back <laughs> for the membership um did you hear that joke no yes i did okay good now now i'll try to say something very important <laughs> Um, a function that is a module factory being invoked by error, good, okay. uh, is, is not the same as a function that is just a function being invoked by error because of a bug. The concern I have is that module factories are indistinguishable from other functions that are being called in the wrong place because of bad code. That um... I can hear you again. Uh, I'm going to mute. The last we heard was my concern is that module factory. <laughs> Somebody's playing with us here. <laughs> okay, so I'm saying that uh, unlike other functions that exist already in the code, this new module factory function um, invoked by accident in the wrong place. It has has uh, completely different um, concerns attached to it um, compared to other functions that already exist in code. And what are those concerns? Because I'm um, you're cutting. I, I don't think it's it's possible to make this uh, less confusing. <laughs> with all the interruptions. So maybe, maybe we can adjourn and talk about it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Salah, the last, I, I think we're going to, to um, because everything was working so recently, I think we're going to adjourn soon, 33, 40. But just to, re, uh, I think this last question is worth getting your answer on record though. Um, so I asked, what are those additional concerns? Because I'm seeing them, the difference between module factory versus arbitrary function. And then when you were answering, I was seeing your microphone icon go up and down, but I was not hearing anything. And now I'm going to mute. Yeah. Um, I don't know the concerns. They're the unknown concerns that come from new functions mixing with code that existed before them. Um, they are not expected be, um, concerns for the code that is written as it is right now. Okay. I, I, I have a point also on this topic, but I think the audio is not going to cooperate, so I'll I'll save it for next time. Uh, uh, Richard, right now I can hear you fine. Why don't you give it a try? <laughs> All right, uh, just to uh, follow on that then, my perspective and my thoughts are always drawn to migration and how do we deal with the pre-existing code. Um, if, if you just provide less capability, then I, I think that's the best model. Like there, it, the interface of something that's already been written doesn't need to change. It's just that an extension to it that wants more capability than someone who's depending on it is willing to give will fail and will fail at runtime. Frustrating place for it to cut off. Um, uh, let's go ahead and adjourn the meeting and uh, let's just uh, um, take care of this by, by a combination of offline posts and just resuming on Thursday. Um, um, but also investigate the cause of the glitch we're having today. Um, that would be very bad for future meetings. 
Yeah, I, I noticed it started after we unplugged our microphone and plugged it back in. And oh. Moved the laptop, and so I'm hoping maybe that had something to do with it. Oh. So oh. I was the glitch, basically. <laughs> Sorry. It, <laughs> I don't know. I'm it, the one who unplugged and replugged. So. It, it, and I noticed that the lights on our little external microphone unit are a different color now than they were before. Oh. Um, okay. So I don't know. We'll okay. figure it out. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. See you next time.